yes, yes, oh, and uh, remote people. I suppose you can see the slides, right? Let's start then. All right, hey, um, welcome back, everyone. So today we're going to continue to talk about reverse engineering. Um, uh, you know, just finish what we have uh, talked about for, uh, you know, from last time. And then after that, we will start to talk about interesting software vulnerabilities. Okay, so uh, before everything, announcement, we're not going to have class on Thursday. So uh, this is going to be the only class that we have for this week. After today, you're done with this week, and then I'm going to see you guys on um, next week. So no more class on Thursday. Please be uh, oh, please just remember for that. Don't you don't have to come here while on Thursday. Okay, so um, this is uh, you know the uh, challenge that we talked about last time, right? If you still remember, uh, this is a uh, program that asks you for. Uh, you know, uh, the question, ask you the question of how many pages for a specific Harry Potter's uh, book. And if you, were, you answer the, uh, you know, the question correctly, then this challenge will give you the key. Uh, if you, of course, if you don't answer that correctly, then the challenge will not give you the key and instead it will just access. Uh, and last time we talked about two approaches that we can still find a key even though that you don't know exactly the number of pages for the specific hair color book. Okay, so you know, last time with the first, uh, the first way is to use the strings. Uh, you know, it is a static approach that will just parse the uh, data section of the binary and get those like interesting uh, vertical strings over there. Um, and for this challenge, it stores the flag there inside the program. And that's why if you just do the you know, strings followed by the program, you will be able to get the specific keys, the, the flags. And then we talk about the second approach, right? So the second approach is to use each or either like those kind of set analysis tools. Uh, well, I mean, to be more specific, to be precise, uh, Gidra and Ada also has dynamic features, but we only use the static features while we are using it. So we use Gidra and Ada to uh, like parse the binary, turn it on, open it, and we uh, look at how the program works. We look at the so-called control flow graph, you know, like the you know the execution of the. Uh, um, of the program. So we see that there is a main entry, there's a main function. And then followed by that, which part of the program is executed. And then we find the place that, uh, you know, it gives the right string, give you the right answer. And then that way we got a string, got the key. Okay. And then now I am going to talk about the third and fourth approach, which is a, uh, as a hybrid static plus dynamic approach. All right, give me a second. I am going to uh, set it up. Okay, what I'm doing right now is I am opening Ida. And uh, I am trying to find out the examples that we had last night. Uh, reshare my screen. All right, people from Zoom, you should be able to see Ida now. So this is how it looks like if you open Ida, 
and then if you use Ida to open the uh, example.out challenge, right? So if you remember last time, we said that this is the, uh, the so-called control flow graph where those instructions um, you know, are reside in the, each of the, like one of those blocks. And then those blocks, it has, you know, is an arrow, is a directed graph. Every time it will, you know, point to the next places that the instructions will be executed. And sometimes you will see two branches out of one basic block, and that's because of the conditional DOM. Okay. And uh, let me turn on the address. So we'll be able to see the address here. Okay. So we see that there are, you know, addresses here, you know, it shows the, um, you know, the address of those uh, commands of those uh, instructions. So what we're doing now is that uh, we are going to run the program. So this time, instead of really looking at the key directly, we are going to run this program and see, you know, what is the condition that we can trigger in order to let the program output the key. You can consider this you know, program in a way that instead of it outputs the keys directly, what if it just read the key from a secret file, like you know, slash flag, those kinds of a file. So in that case, if you're gonna using a static approach, um, then you will not be able to get the flag because the flag is not in the program, right? So we may need to rely on dynamic approach in order to execute the program. You have to execute the program and then make the program to run, you know, get the right value from you so that it will continue to run that correctly. And then it will open the flag for you. All right. So then, you know, we know, we look at the, you know, the disassembly of the uh, binary. And then we know that we hope to, let the program run you know, to this point, because this is the point that it will tell you that you are correct and it give you the right key. So, but then how to run to this basic block, right? Apparently there is a, uh, another you know, conditional jump before that, and you need to jump to the right position after that. So how to make it work? Let's use GDB to run the program and then set a breakpoint at this particular address. It's like right before it executes the conditional jump. So let's let the program execute to this part and then see, you know, what are those registers values and then how can we control that so that we can give the right answer. Okay. Um, let me reshare. All right, so you should be able to see uh, my screen. Um, so let's use GDB, run example out, okay? And we know that this is the place that we're interested in, right? So let's set a breakpoint. The place is at 916. Um, actually, let me just do a main function, let's just start um, you know, set a breakpoint at the main function. Okay. And then let's run it. Okay. Now we see that it breaks at this particular function, it's main function. And you can check the instruction using this command. It means that PC is the current program counter. And this instruction means that you want to you know, um, access the memory at this particular address, which is the program counter. And slash I, I here means that you want to output in a format of instruction. Okay, so now you see that, you know, this is the uh, uh, address in the offset of hex nine, uh, eight, nine C. It has sub, um, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, in, in intermediate value, hex 90 um, from uh, uh, RSP. And this is in at and syntax because you see that like registers, it has the percent sign uh, at the beginning of each, uh, you know, operand. 
the you know register operand. Okay, so uh, that is uh, that corresponds to this particular instruction, right? So it's the same, you know, the same address hex eight nine C, the same instruction, and then we want to go to here, right, to to see what is the value of this conditional dot. So let's set another breakpoint at nine one six. So you use the uh, B command and a star hex 916. And then we'll set a breakpoint there you know, at this address. And then we just press C, hit enter. I will continue to execute until it hits the, you know, another breakpoint. And in this case, it is the second breakpoint that got hit. If you just set another breakpoint, you know, like something in the loop, then it's possible that the first breakpoint will be hit again. All right. So now we hit the second breakpoint, right? And then we know that there are two values that are being compared before we do conditional job, which is EDX and EAX, right? And there is a J and Z. It means that it wants to compare if these two registers are, uh, you know, equal, basically, right? Because NZ means they're non-zero. So what this instructions um do is that it compare edx and ex if it's if edx and ex are not equal then it will jump to 926 which is this part right and then it will uh, output your run so that means that we hope that these two in, uh, registers are the same so that we can jump to the right place okay so now let's check the value of this two register so you can use the P command and then have you know EAX, you got a value, and also the EDX, you get another value. Okay, so you see that the EDX is something uh, in the negative, and you know that this is not really the case. Okay, so you can compare this to now, right? So these two instructions, you see that. Um, one is from uh, this particular address. Like this is a, uh, sorry, this is the uh, uh, stack places, right? And this is another stack places. So basically, if you read this before, there is a scan f function that are called. So it will read what you have put there, right? You put that and then you read, uh, you, uh, you get that value, which is the EAX value. And that stores into um, var uh, 84. So we know that this is something, EX is, should be something that is controllable. And we need to have EX value equal to EDX value, right? So now what you could do is you can just set the register, you know, Oops, sorry. Um, you can just set the, uh, there we go. You can set the uh, register value. Um, you inside the GDB command. So basically inside the GDB command, what you could do is, for example, you could do set and then set, you know, uh, say EAX or EDX is equal to the value. Let's do this. Okay. And now if you just print the EAX value again, that turns to this value, which is same as EDX. Okay. And now we just continue to execute it. Oh, um, there is a breakpoint. Okay, let's uh, disable that breakpoint. All right, it asks you the uh, the value, right? Okay, uh, let me just run this again. I think there's a problem when I set the uh, breakpoint. Okay. 
what's the offset, right? Sorry, say again? It, it's like when you set three points, you set like main and plus and offset. Is it starting at like x555? Five, five, five? Right. So you need to, right. So basically, I need to set this because this is the uh, offset of the, uh, the address. So we need to change this to uh, 916. We can also just use the uh, offset. Okay, here we go. Now it should work. Let's do this again. So we set the breakpoint, we run it. We disable the third breakpoint. And then let's uh, run this again. Okay, and then continue, right? We just put some random values over there. Okay, so now it stops at the breakpoint four, which is uh, uh, this location. And then we can do a double check. Okay, right, so it is at this particular address that it's gonna do this, uh, you know, jump, conditional jump. And you may find that this is different. One is called JNZ and the other is called JNE. It's actually the same operand. It's just like for at and and Intel, they have different ways to interpret it, like give this uh, different letters, but it has the same thing, basically. It means that uh, uh, you wanna make sure that this two register, which is EDX and EX are not the same. All right, so now let's do this again, or EAX and EDX, right? And we wanna make these two values the same, right, equal. So again, let's set the value, uh, uh, EAX is equal to HexDF. All right, and then let's continue. It says it's, I am wrong, I need to keep going. All right, let's do this again. Run that again, continue, continue. Put some random numbers over there. Break point, and then um, take the value of, oh, okay, I know the problem. So the problem is that we are setting the breakpoint at this place. So that means that the comparison instruction is already done. So that's why I cannot, you know, jump to the right place, even though I changed the value. So we should really set the breakpoint at this place. Okay. So I want to say that, you know, although I'm making this, those errors, they're not intentional. This is not part of the plot. But I think it's nice that, you know, you guys see, this is usually the way that we debug problem, that we debug programs and then found errors and then analyze it and just understand what's going wrong and then continue to do that. And hopefully like this kind of a self debugging process will help you because you're gonna debug things by yourself in the future. All right, so let's reset the breakpoint. So what we really need to set is here. Um, so it should be a 914, disable the fourth appointment, rerun it again, start from the beginning, continue, put some random numbers over there. Cool, now we're at this place. And then we again uh, output the value of EAX, EDX, of course they're not equal and we're gonna make them equal by using the set, uh, uh, set command we make EAX is equal to hex DF, okay? All right, now let's continue. Cool, now I said you're correct, and then you got the key, all right? So you see that in this case, actually I'm not really understanding what the program is doing. I'm, I'm not really even look at, you know, the strings that uh, outputs from the program. All I care in this case, you know, is, to let the program execute to the right place and output the key. And I don't really care what values that I put them. I, I don't know. I don't even need to know, you know, the program asks you for anything about Harry Potter's book, right? So I just execute to that specific point and then pause the program's execution and then to set a, the register, the direct register's value over there instead of like caring about like those inputs that that should be uh, should be fitted into the program correctly. All right. 
So uh, this is another solution. You know, it's dynamic. You need to run it, but then you don't need to know like the semantics of this program. Okay. And then now I'm going to show you another, you know, a fourth solution to solving this challenge. So again, that we know that we need to let this program to jump to this place, right? To execute. And then we know that there is a condition over here. There is a conditional jump. What it tries to do is that it tries to compare if EDX and EAX are equal, right? And it says, okay, if it's equal, then it's gonna jump to this, you are correct part of the basic line. Well, then I'll put the key. Um, what about we actually, rewrite the program. We change the program in a way that when it detects unequal, it will go to the right basic block, the basic block that we want. And in order to do that, all we need to do is to change this program a little bit so that it will go to this basic block for the most of the time, whenever it's unequal. And that means that we want to change this specific instruction, right? So instead of making it jump when it is equal, let's tell them that, hey, now you need to jump when it is not equal. And in fact, if you look at the binary, you know, those are just instructions that are stored in the binary. And then you can just change the writer binary directly, add the binary, you know, and then in that case, you added the instruction and then you just turn, you know, just like, you know, switch the, the logic for this instruction. Okay, so now let's do this together. So first of all, let's um, um, use our editor to open this program. And before that, let me just save a copy in case that I mess it up. Okay, so now I'm going to just open the program, all right? There are a bunch of nonsense over there. You know, it's not readable. I can really parse, but I don't care. I'm gonna do a hex stop, right? Okay. And then I'm gonna find this particular offset. It tells me that it, the offset is at 916, right? And then this hex, hex 916. Okay, so I'm gonna go to that place. Here we go. This is 910, right? And this is uh, 911, 912, 913, 914. Uh, oh, actually, it starts at, it starts at uh, 910. So it's 910, 910. I'm just parsing it. Hold on. Okay. Okay, it's, it should be the this this sequence because this is not represented in the uh, little Indian uh, format. Okay, so this is 910, 911, 912, 913, 914, 915, and 916. Okay, so this is supposed to be the start of this instruction. And in fact, let's use uh, GDB. Do a double check. All right. Example that out. So opt-down, sorry, not GDB, opt-down. You know, we just statically disassemble that and then go to this particular address. Remember that is 916, right? There we go. So see that uh, at 916, it has two, this particular instruction is composed of two bytes. 95 and 0 e and this instruction means j and e go to um, address 926 so now we're going to change this from j and e to j e okay means that if it's equal if these two numbers are equal then go to the you're wrong otherwise you're always correct and now is the time that you need to google for you know the byte for this particular instruction j e can you guys do that for me? So uh, just Google that, find the X the 664, you know, instruction reference, find the bytes that corresponds to 
JE, that specific conditional job. So it's like job one is equal. And while you guys are doing this, I'm looking at the chat. We got a very nice question asking, could you change when it jumps to location 916 instead of location 926? The answer is yes. Yes, you can also do that. And another is like, you're just a compare EDS to EDS to EDX. Yes, you know, that's also a way that you can change the program. Question here is J and E the same as J and Z? Yes, it's the same. It's just different uh, uh, monomic, basically. It's the same bytes. All right, I already get um, the answer from Zoom. So do you guys get the answer on site people? Yes? Okay, so that's a 74, right? You get it? Uh, some of you said you may found another solution that's called, uh, the answer is 0F84. So if you look at the instructions reference, I'm gonna just show here real quick. Uh, and uh, Zoom people, let me know if you can't see this uh, website. I suppose I, I'm sharing this correctly with you guys now. Yep, okay. You can use whichever uh, website that, that you have. I'm just showing one, you know, one, one thing that I got from Google. And you may found that, you know, there is another solution. It has 0584. And that one is different. That is a so-called near jump opcode, and this is different from a short code opcode. And the difference is that when you do short jump, the value that's right next to this OP code is the relative location to this current instruction. Um, and you don't really want to change the number of bytes that represents this specific instruction, because if you change that, Later on, for other jump instructions, um, there may be some, you know, offset issues because sometimes when we do like memory reference, it takes a offset. So just to be safe, you know, when you change this instruction, you want to make sure that you know the instruction after you change it is within the same or equal number of bytes uh, as the previous instruction. And also, specifically in this case, when it uses JNZ, it uses 95, 75, right? Let's take a look. So here it is 75, right? That is the short jump OB code. And then right after that 0E, that is the relative address that you want to jump to. So that's why if you, you know, if you add 916, with hex zero e, you will get two. Uh, sorry, nine two six. Those are all in hex, right? So that is nine two six, and that is the other like a you know wrong. You're wrong. Those uh, those basic block. All right, and then uh, let me connect. Actually, we don't really need to connect. We already know the uh, this thing. Um. Right. Okay. Oops. Um. Again, let's go to that particular address, 916. Okay, so now we know that we need to change this byte from 74 to 75. 
right? Okay, so let's do it. Again, let's open this binary. You see, that's really nasty fancy. Like those executables that you run every day, if you look at that, they're just literally, you know, a file of bytes. Uh, let me uh, try to revert it back. Okay, here we go. All right, let's find the position. It's right here. And we need to change this from 75 to 74, right? Okay, and now let's write it back. Uh, I can use dash R, right? And then write it back. Okay, now we have a new example dialed. Let's try to run it. Put some random number over there. All right, we're correct. So you just put a random number because we changed the logic of the program. It's okay, whatever number that you put there, as long as it's a, you know, it's a digit, it's parsable, then you will get your right key. Okay. And as you some of you guys said, you know, there are many ways that you can change this program. I just changed this conditional jump, but you can also change the, uh, uh, you know, like the, sorry, I forgot what you guys, like the jumps, the destination, right? You can change the destination, which is the second byte right after, you know, in this uh, instruction. You could also change the, uh, you know, the uh, instruction that compare EDX with VDX. Uh, I saw some of you guys from chat say that uh, maybe EDX, uh, you cannot really change to EDX to EDX. Um, I doubt, I think you should be able to, a, the program should work if you change it from like compare EDX, EDX, or compare EX, EDX, EAX. Either should be fine. Okay. Um, okay, and, and now I'm saying that there are very interesting discussions from our chat, people asking you know more questions like what are possible solutions? What are possible overriding solutions? So change the jump to no up, it will just run everything. Yes, that could be the case because you know the correct block, you know the correct block that we are, um, um, you know we hope to execute is right after the block that uh, you know conducts this you know those condition check. Right, so maybe what you could do is just do you know no op is like a hex ninety. So it's always starting from address nine one four, always just a hex ninety 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 ninety, and two you have nine one eight. That can work. Yep. So there are a lot of interesting ways that you can change and you can play around this 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 challenge. And I hope that this example really just shows you that you know don't be afraid of touching binary because after all. The binary itself is just a bunch of bytes. It's just a bunch of, you know, um, instructions, et cetera. And then you can rewrite it. And in that way you can rewrite this, you know, the logic of the binary. Okay, good. All right, so let's um, come back to the, uh, our slides. So that is all about reverse engineering. And now we're gonna start to talk about some interesting uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, you guys may already heard some of those vulnerabilities like buffer overflow or uh, heap overflow, use after fray, et cetera. Uh, those are the security holes that careless uh, software developer, you know, may, may make a mistake while they're developing code. And we don't really want that to happen especially after you guys you know become a developer in the future or become a security researchers so that's why we want to talk about those vulnerabilities to let you understand you know what is the vulnerability about why this is bad what kind of a consequence that can it lead to and also more importantly how you could um, fix or how you could you know uh, prevent those kind of vulnerabilities in the future um, and to demonstrate that, you know, to demonstrate 
how bad it can be for vulnerability, that's why we want to touch the tackle part, because in that case, you will be able to understand, okay, those are the potential risks of having a vulnerability. And that's why you need to really make sure that you don't have that while you develop a code. And also, Summer, if you're going to become a cybersecurity expert in the future, if you're going to like make, like for example, vulnerability research as your job, then you need to find those vulnerabilities for developers, letting them know about it. And this lecture, uh, and perhaps the next as well, will teach you how to find those vulnerabilities and how to show them to demonstrate the existence of those vulnerabilities to the other people. Okay, so we're gonna start with the first vulnerability. It's called command line injection. Raise your hand if you have, you know, if you heard about this before. No? Okay, that's okay. That's why we have today's lecture. Okay, so let's start with this function, all right? So this is a function called check. And what it does is that, you know, there is a command. It will um, first construct this command. So like the check will takes ID as an input. Consider this, you know, as something like, we are running a program in our class that are gonna get uh, and asks you guys to participate, like ask for participation. You need to kind of log in or register yourself into the service so that, so that you know that you're participate, you're participating in the class so that I know that you are participating in this class. Um, so what this uh, function is trying to do is that it will take your name or your ID, whatever, you know, your token, your handle, and then chat if your handle already exists in my records folder, okay? So what it tries to do is that it will first come up with this command, you know, it has as print f, it means that it will print the string to the destination, where in this case, command is the destination, and then the next argument is the format string. In the third or the fourth are those arguments, uh, parameters for this format string, okay? So it will first come up with this command using S print F, and then the next is gonna use system to call this command. So for example, if you have um, ID is Tiffany B, then it will use system to execute cat records slash Tiffany D, or just try to find this file, to cut this file, read it, okay? So the issue here is that I don't really have to give it the, you know, a ID or say just an ID. I can make, you know, another like shell uh, or bash command after this ID. So if I add, another you know command right after this uh, id and then connect them using semicolon so if you look at the command ob look like this right so this cat record slash tiffany b that looks very normal but because i append this part you know another uh, command right after my id then when system executes it it will execute both command so, and suppose that we know that there is a secret file over there already then you in this case we will be able to read the secret file using this you know not, not related like the uh, a, a program that is supposed to be normal and that is the vulnerability of this uh, of this program and this is the so-called command line injection basically you can inject an arbitrary command uh, because of system command, because of this vulnerable um, calling. And actually the reason, the reason why it is vulnerable, or say the root cause of this vulnerability is that first there is no like sanity check for this command. And also second for system, this specific uh, you know, command from C, it will just execute command. It doesn't 
matter like how many instructions or how many commands inside this specific string. It will execute all of them. All right. So uh, now let's uh, do a demo together. Um, I will show you the source code. And then your job is to uh, launch an attack, like to execute an arbitrary command to um, the server. And uh, give me a second. I don't, I'm not sure if the server is already up. I may need to turn it up again, but give me a second. Okay, it's not up. Let me turn it up real quick. All right, it showed up. Now, if you do netcat, you know, just this command and see, uh, followed by this address and this port, you should be able to access this. And then let me show you the source code real quick. I see that you guys are running and you guys are connecting to it. I can see that from my end, right? And let me know if you get the secret file, okay? Someone just listed my uh, root directory. Great, good job. Hopefully you find something interesting over there. All right. This is the program. Someone is really trying hard to access my uh, directory. I saw some root permission log from my aunt. I will give you some time and let me know if you manage to get it. Just raise your hand, I will see it. And Zoom people just, you know, type in the chat and I, I'm tracking it. So I will know that if you already get the secret file. Great, I see someone from chat already get my secret. Dennis got it.
Uh, anyone else get it? No? So some hints here. This is the program. Um, you know, we're saying this is more of the uh, the main or the menu program, uh, the function. And um, it will ask you for your uh, ASU ID. You know, if you're uh, uh, try to check participation and then it will call check function. And there is a vulnerability in check function. And that's the command long injection vulnerability, okay? All right, you guys get it? Let's do this together. All right, let's just close it up. Okay, so first of all, let's connect it. Let's connect to it using this uh, netcat command, right? Okay, so the first is the address and the second argument is the port number to connect to it. Okay, it asks you to either just check participation or exit. So let's do one check participation and then ask you for ASU ID, right? And if you remember, for this program, it asks you for your ASU ID, and then it will get some values from you, and then it will check this value, right? And then the vulnerabilities is in this check function. So we need to let this check function be called. So let's write some random values over there. And then let's do cat secret, okay? Actually, that starts with LS. You know, just take a look at how it looks like in the current folder. Okay, so this is the readout that we get from LS. If you just like do some normal thing, there's nothing really, um, you know, turns on the shows displays over there. But if you added your ID follows by another command you will see the output, okay? Okay, so now let's do something else. So let's say, do some random ID, right? And then do who am I? You can see this is output of who am I. Okay, so now we know this is, it really works. Now we just need to find a secret in the captain, right? And if remember, if you do LS, you found that there is a secret file. Let's try to open it. So let's do this, one, two, three, whatever your ASU IDs. And then do cat secret. Let's take a look. All right. It doesn't really show anything, right? It doesn't show the secret file. But if you see this command, you found that this is the command that it executes. It's not cat secret. So this must mean that there is a limit of the length of the string that read it. So that means that we need to make our command a little bit shorter. Okay, so let's do this again. Let's do this without a space. There we go. Now you get my secret. This is the, uh, you know, a vulnerability that you can take advantage to read an arbitrary file or the secret. And of course you can do the other stuff. You know, this basically you can just execute uh, an arbitrary uh, bash command using a command line instruction. Okay. All right. So this is for command line instruction. Then let's talk about defense how to not have command line instruction in your code if you indeed need to execute, you know, like bash command or something in your program, which is quite common. 
right? So the solution is that using this system function, it can be pretty dangerous because you know you either have to really make sure that you do sanity check on this command correctly, you know, on this argument uh, fitted into system correctly, or um, you don't want to use system. You can use another command, uh, not another function is that uh, another function from this the like, exec exit family. There are, you know, like this, this family has a bunch of different functions. And for those functions, you can give them different, you know, arguments. Some of them, they will just take the path of the uh, you know, command. Uh, but you cannot give it two commands, you know, as the entire string. You have to pass this, like, for example, e exit l, you need to pass this, like, entire argument. The first is the path. And then the second, and then like those, this three parts are the argument. So this is the argument zero, arc zero. And this is the second argument, which is arc one and the arc two. So it tells you that you need to uh, ls this particular directory. And there's no way for you to like put a semicolon followed by another command. And also, you know, for this specific command, uh, this this function for axi me, you can also pass like environment variables um, that will make your executing you know more convenient. You can specify the environment variables while you are executing a specific uh, bash command or a specific binary executable. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so for example, this is the vulnerable uh, program that we just talked about because of system. You know it is vulnerable and also because command we don't have any sanity check for command we don't check if command is one or two executables that's one or two commands over there but instead we can just replace system with exccl and then uh pass the correct argument to exccl in this case if you have like this um, id is equal to an arbitrary value followed by an instruction this won't run successfully. And in this case, you can uh, successfully stop this command line injection attacks. Okay, so uh, that is one vulnerability. And then next, let's talk about another different vulnerabilities. It's called directory traversal, okay? Um, so, Suppose that we already patched this problem. You know, we no longer have command line injections. We have this new, more secure, you know, check function. Uh, what it's trying to do here is that, again, it takes an ID as the input, and then it try to, you know, catch this um, ID, like this path position. The path is uh, under records, um, this folder. So it still has vulnerabilities. The good things is that it doesn't have command line injection anymore. However, if someone is clever or bad enough, what they can do is to change this ID to something like, you know, like dot stop secret. So instead of really looking at the record directory, you can change the string, um, you know, of the second part of the directory so that it will go like jump out outside of this specific folder and visit or access any other files that you know outside this folder because again this is no check for this id path right so in this case if we have pass id with like dot dot slash secret um then instead of read like records slash tiffany b you know, the, one of those items inside the records, it will actually just do cat records and then slash dot dot, which means that you go outside of the records and then secret. Yeah, you will be able to get the secret file. We'll be able to catch that. Okay. Um, there is another demo for that. And then let me, uh, give me a second. Let me turn it on the service and then you can do this directory traversal attack for yourself.
Okay, you should be able to, you can't connect to the server right now. Um, you may found there is a timeout. Don't panic because I am resetting uh, the uh, service. All right, the service is on. And let me uh, show the code. to see that this is the vulnerable function. This check function was called in this uh, verification, again, in this verification uh, menu. And uh, the secret files location is the same as the last time. So it's a uh, parallel with the record uh, folder. And raise your hand if you manage to uh, find a secret. The secret file or the secret content? Yes, it's the same as before. Good job. Okay, so uh, let's do this real quick. Again, let's connect to it, right? And now it asks you for a check participation log or exit. And uh, so here we need to uh, check the participation and ask for SU ID, right? So instead of typing something that is normal, like Tiffany B, we're gonna type something uh, abnormal. So we have dot dot uh, slash or backslash, that's slash, right? Yeah, back, uh, dot dot slash means that you wanna go to the upper directory and then access the secret file. There we go. And outputs the content of the secret file. It has Tiffany's secret over there. Okay, so now you will be able to nail a directory or call the path traversal. Then how to defend it, right? How you can protect yourself from being attacked by uh, this vulnerability. So the first thing that you wanna do is to make sure that if you're gonna write a program like that, you're gonna catch you know, a particular record, catch a, a particular location of the file and show the file's content, then you wanna check the path. You wanna make sure that the path is legitimate. It doesn't you know, access anywhere else. Um, or, or, and you also wanna make sure that the permission of the file is set correctly. Means that even though that someone is able to, you know, use this like command vulnerable, use this vulnerability and you know, maliciously want to access the file, you want to set the file with the right permission so that that guy with his you know, users with that uh, role, it will not be able to read or write that particular file. You, know, you want to specify the permission correctly. And that's why sometimes if you just you know, run some commands, you will see permission denied because that means that you know, there is a the permission that has to be set for that you know, maybe a folder or a file, and that's why currently you cannot open it. You just got a permission, you know, rejected because of this like uh, permission setup of the file. 
Okay, so you know, back to our example. Um, what we could do is before we really call this cat followed by the path, we want to add a valid path check. And then in this valid path check, we can check if the path always just go inside the record folder. folder. Okay, so that's, um, you know, for um, defense, that's for our directory traversal. Um, that's everything that we have for today. And starting from next lecture, we will talk about uh, a, a even funner vulnerability, Stack Overflow. All right, thanks everyone, see you next week.